Well, hello everybody. Uh, All those people are taking mythology. So. Okay. Well, I was going to say that it feels more like a seminar than a, than a lecture, but that's even better. Um, good. Um, so we are now in a new course. Uh, but we're still going to be building on the previous courses and expanding on them. And today's topic is going to be actually a continuation of something that you did already in the first course and you'll be continu continuing with in this course, and that is the metabolism of nucleic acids. Uh, so you spoke about the structure of nucleic acids, a little bit about what happens to them. You're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in this course. But today I want to talk to you about uh, how the building blocks of nucleic acids, that is nucleotides, are built, are synthesized. So we're going to be talking about metabolism, both the synthesis and the degradation of nucleotides today. However, I would like you to think about this lecture as a first part of a double lecture, because in a couple of weeks' time we're going to have a lecture together about the treatment of cancer, uh, and we're going to be very much building on what we talk about today. Okay, so uh, because a lot of drugs that are used to treat cancer are uh, interfering with, um, with the metabolism of nucleotides. Um, so today it's going to be the, the basis for it, and then in a couple of weeks' time we're going to build on it uh, to explain how various uh, medications work. All right? So don't think that it's done today. Okay, there are still further steps uh, to go. All right, so if we're going to talk about nucleotides, let's first revise what nucleotides are and what kind of nucleotides do we know. Okay, so what is a nucleotide? Very good, so, so it's always composed of a nitrogenous base. Uh, there is a sugar, what kind of sugar? What kinds of sugar? Could be ribose or deoxyribose, depending on whether it's a ribonucleotide or deoxyribonucleotide, very good. And then there's a phosphate group. All right, in addition to nu nucleotides, chemically speaking, we also have bits of it. So we already mentioned the base, so that's, that's the nitrogenous part. And if we just put together the base and the sugar, we get a nucleoside, all right? So this is just the basic terminology that hopefully you're all comfortable with. All right, so what, kind of what kinds of nucleotides do we have in the nucleic acids? There is, of course, a very large number of other kinds of nucleotides, but let's not talk about them. Let's talk about the ones that are actually in nucleic acids. So, what? so let's talk about nucleotides. Nucleotides. Adenosine monophosphate, very good. Adenosine monophosphate, guanosine monophosphate, cytidine monophosphate. There's uridine monophosphate, very good. Uridine monophosphate and and thymidine monophosphate. Okay. So adenosine, guanosine, thymidine, and cytidine, and uridine monophosphate. So these five nucleotides are commonly found in nucleic acids. Uh, and we know that uridine monophosphate is only, well, generally is only found in, in RNA. So it's, it's really, it only exists in nucleic acid as a ribonucleotide, but we'll see that we can actually make di the, uh, deoxyuridine as well, but we'll see that for synthesis of something else. And on the other hand, thymidine only exists as a deoxyribonucleotide. Okay, so this is a bit confusing because for all the other ones we have to say deoxyribo, or deoxyadenosine, deoxycytidine, or whatever, but for thymidine it's always deoxy, so we don't say that. Okay, when we say thymidine, we always mean that there's deoxyribose there. Okay, because that's the only form that it normally exists in. It's a bit confusing, but that's, that's how it is. All right, good. Now, these five nucleotides, or five bases, if we just want to talk about the bases, we can divide them into two groups, chemically. Into purines and pyrimidines. Which ones are which? Very good. So adenine or adenosine, whatever. Adenine is a purine. Guanine is a purine. And the rest of them are pyrimidines. All right? Okay, so this was just a brief revision. Hopefully, this is something that's easy for you. 
and we'll now talk about how these purines and pyrimidines are built. Now, we'll start with pyrimidines. Okay, we'll start with pyrimidines. First of all, because the, uh, the structure itself is a lot simpler than the, the structure of, this, of, the, of the cycle for purines. But also the synthesis is actually relatively simple because similar to the synthesis of heme, if anybody recalls that, there is this huge massive structure which, in, which actually we, the whole thing is built just from two components. Two components are put together and then it's just assembled into this huge structure. So there's a similar pattern in a way for pyrimidine synthesis where we basically build the whole pyrimidine essentially from two components and then we just kind of chop things off and add some things to it, all right? Uh, so it's a lot simpler. For the purine synthesis that we're gonna continue with afterwards, the synthesis is much more complicated because we're literally building the whole purine cycle atom by atom, sort of, okay? Uh, so there are a lot of steps, and we're not going to go through all the steps, and you're not required to know all the steps, but we will mention some of the steps that we want you to, um, to know, okay? So for, for pyrimidines, we're going to do all of it. For purines, we're just going to do the beginning and the end, pretty much, okay? And the rest of it is, is, is not that important at this point. All right. So for the synthesis of pyrimidines, we start with a substance that you've already seen, but you've seen it in a different context. Does anyone recall what this is? It's carbamoyl phosphate, very good. It's carbamoyl phosphate. And does anyone recall, like from this part, where, which metabolic pathway you saw it in? We haven't really covered pure instances. Oh, what did you say? Sorry, maybe I just misunderstood. No, wait, wait, wait. This, this part, yeah? In the urea cycle, very good. Okay, it's the first step in the urea cycle. And in the urea cycle, we build carbon phosphate from what? From ammonia? Bicarbonate? And ATP, all right? So this is how we build carbon phosphate in the urea cycle, and this reaction occurs in, in liver, and, and as a cellular, the urea cycle occurs in the, <laughs> yes, very good. Okay, the beginning of it uh, occurs in the mitochondria. So the synthesis of carbon phosphate in the urea cycle occurs in the mitochondria. All right, okay, let's slow down a little bit, okay? I'm not sure that everybody knows all these things, all right? Uh, so that's in the urea cycle. In the synthesis of pyrimidines, we also build carbon monophosphate. Well, we build, we build it differently from different starting materials, and it occurs in the cytoplasm. So this is a cytoplasmic reaction. And we don't start with ammonia, but for the donor, for the donor of nitrogen, we use glutamine, okay? So we start with glutamine. From that, we only need the nitrogen. We also need bicarbonate, so that's the same. And we need two molecules of ATP. Okay, and we make carbon phosphate. Even though we're building the same building block, the, the same starting substance, we are in a different compartment and we are using different uh, enzyme and we're, we're using uh, d different uh, starting substances. So, okay, so there are similar reactions, similar things, but, but they are actually quite significantly different. However, there do exist enzyme disorders. Uh, we're not gonna talk about them today, but there, there are some disorders of the urea cycle, and I think maybe in some of the clinical detective stories, um, maybe there was something mentioned about that, where there is a crossover between pyrimidine synthesis and, and urea cycle, but let's not worry about it now. All right, so, so we made um, carbamyl phosphate. The enzyme activity is called carbamyl phosphate synthase 2. So the one in the urea cycle is called carbamyl phosphate synthase 1. It's carbamyl phosphate synthase 2. But as we'll see in a second, it's actually part of a larger enzyme that does several things at once, okay? So you can remember this as a carbamyl phosphate, uh, carbon phosphate synthase 2 activity, but it's actually part of a bigger enzyme. We'll, we'll get to that in a second. All right, so this is the first starting substance for pyrimidine synthesis. 
The other one is already made. It's an amino acid that we find pretty much elsewhere or we can synthesize it and that's aspartic acid. So we built the whole pyrimidine ring using just carbonyl phosphate and aspartate. We join them together and we basically have a pyrimidine ring. All right? So let's draw that. So this bit is, this part is it's aspartic acid, okay, yeah, and this is carbomorphosphate that we just made by, by this first reaction, all right, and you can already sort of start to see that when this nitrogen connects to this carbon and this carbon connects to this nitrogen, we're already building the pyrimidine ring. What we get, there are actually two steps in this involved, but it's not really that important to know that there are two steps. And we make a ring which looks like this. Okay. Which looks like this. Yes? It's in the cytoplasm. It's in the cytosol. Sorry? Uh, potentially any cell is capable of synthesizing pyrimidines. Okay? Um, for pyrimidines, it's not super, there's no super specific organ. For purines, the majority of that occurs in the liver. Um, for pyrimidines, pretty much any cell can synthesize it. So, we get this ring, or this substance, and this substance is called dihydroorotic acid. Obviously, hydrogen's here. That's called dihydro dihydroorotate or orotic acid. Dihydroorotate. Your question? Yeah. So yes, the phosphate leaves and water leaves there. Yeah. <coughs> now, these three reactions that I just showed, it looks like two, but there are actually two steps here. Okay, so these three reactions are all catalyzed by the same big enzyme that has three enzyme activities. Okay, the enzyme is called CAD which is just an abbreviation of the three enzyme activities that the enzyme possesses, okay? So the C stands for carbamyl phosphate synthase, which we had before. The A stands for aspartate transcarbamylase or carbamyl transferase, which basically connects carbamyl phosphate to aspartate. Carbamyl transferase or transcarbamylase. And the D stands for dihydroorotase, which is the enzyme that connects the other, other part of the, um, of the ring. Okay, so these three enzyme activities are all part of one protein. The idea behind it, the evolutionary idea behind it is that if we are building these big rings which require a lot of materials and a lot of ATP, etc., you don't really want to rely on diffusion just for the intermediates to move around. It's better to keep them all in one place so that you don't waste some of the, uh, some of the uh, intermediates. This is actually a common feature in most metabolic pathways. <coughs> Even though when you like, have the big maps of metabolism or whatever, it looks like the intermediates are moving all around the cell, they almost never are. 
all these things occur in, in a very small place and most of the enzymes in one metabolic pathway like glycolysis or whatever are very close to each other so that they just hand over the product to the next enzyme. So here evolution actually joined the enzymes into one big enzyme. There is another pathway where we have this multi-enzyme activity complex in fatty acid synthesis, right? The fatty acid synthase is, has also all these different uh, uh, enzyme activities in one protein, again, to kind of uh, save the energy and save the material. Yeah, you've heard of that before, right? Yeah, good. Is there something unclear or? In pyruvate, pyruvate dehydrogenase? Uh, yeah. Well, yes, you could say that there are more enzyme activities, yeah. I mean, it kind of does only one thing. It decarboxylates pyruvate, but you're right that there are actually lots of stuff happening inside the enzyme where the electrons are, are moved around. Yes, you're right, okay. All right, so this is all done by this one enzyme. What do we do next? In the next reaction, we oxidize this molecule. We just add a double bond here, so it's a dehydrogenation. And we make, obviously it's a dehydrogenation, so we make, we have dihydroorotic acid, so we make it into orotic acid, right? Okay, orotic acid. Dehydrogenase, correct. It's dihydroorotate dehydrogenase. Now, what is really interesting about this enzyme is that this enzyme is actually present in the inner mitochondrial membrane. And it uses as its acceptor of electrons, because here we are taking electrons from dihydroorotate, right? So we need to put these electrons somewhere and we put them onto coenzyme Q. So ubiquinone to ubiquinol. Now when we talked about the respiratory chain, we mentioned some other enzymes that also donate electrons to ubiquinol. Does anyone remember? Succinate dehydrogenase, which is the enzyme of which pathway? Wait, 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 wait. Which pathway? It's succinate to fumarate, but which pathway is the part of? Krebs. The Krebs cycle, very good. Okay, so we have succinate dehydrogenase. What else? We spoke about quite a few of them. Huh? That's not an enzyme. ETF. ETF dehydrogenase, very good. Which is part of which pathway? Oh, well, sort of, but not really. Which pathway, in which pathway do we have ETF? Huh? Yeah, what about them? What? That's not a pathway, fatty acids. No. <laughs> Second? ETF? It's electron transferring flavor protein. And it's part of a fundamental mitochondrial pathway, which is called. No. Well, sort of it is, but. Huh? Well, it kind of connects to the respiratory chain, but it's not part of that. Huh? It's beta oxidation, correct, okay? It's a co coenzyme from beta oxidation which needs to be reoxidized by ETF dehydrogenase, right? So it's part of beta oxidation, correct. Okay, okay, let's, let's leave it there, but there are plenty of other enzymes that are dehydrogenases and put their electrons onto coenzyme Q. One of them is in the synthesis of pyrimidines and it's dihydroorotate dehydrogenase, okay? So we start in the cytoplasm and then for this one step, the intermediates have to go into the intermembrane space they dump their electrons via this enzyme onto Q, and then we continue with orotate further on, right? Yes, 
but it doesn't enter into the matrix. Okay, it doesn't go into the matrix. It just it's in the intermembrane space, and the enzyme dihydroorotate dehydrogenase is present in the inner membrane, but it only accesses basically the uh, the intermembrane space. Okay, so it doesn't go into into the matrix. There are no transporters for that. All right. Okay. What we do in the next step is one of the fundamental differences between the synthesis of purines and pyrimidines. Because at this step, we add the sugar. Okay? So basically, everything is ready, pretty much. Actually, when you, when you look at orotic acid, it already kind of looks like one of the pyrimidine bases. Which one? Mm. Huh? Oh. <laughs> okay, now you now you mention all of them. It's uracil. Right? Okay? So we're almost there. Pretty much it's all ready now, okay? But what we do in the next step is not removing this carboxyl group, that's gonna be the step after that, but actually we add the ribose. Now, how do we add the ribose? We have this special intermediate, which, as we'll see, is very important for purines as well, which is this activated ribose. Okay, so the ribose itself would not be able to, to attach to it. But we have this activated ribose, which is called phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. Now, I should draw it for you because, we'll, well, it's actually drawn here from the morning. I can just retrace my steps here. Okay, so this is phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. Now it sounds, maybe to some of you, as a very complicated name, but it really isn't. So this is phosphoribosyl. So what would be the name of this compound if this wasn't here? No. Very good, it's gonna be ribose 5-phosphate. Okay, and we just add two phosphate groups linked by an anhydride, so this is basically like the end of ATP, okay, we just join this pyrophosphate to it, and we get phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, or you can find it as phosphoribosyl diphosphate, that's also a possible name for it. So sometimes you see the abbreviation as PRDP, but it's the same thing, okay? So phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, phosphoribosyl diphosphate is, is the same thing. A very crucial intermediate, and we'll see it again in the synthesis of purines. So it's very, very important. When I said that this step is what makes a fundamental difference between the purine synthesis and pyrimidine synthesis, here ribose is connected to a pyrimidine which is already formed pretty much. Okay? We said that it looks like uracil. Okay? In purine synthesis, as we'll see in a second, we start with ribose and we build the whole ring on ribose, okay? A big difference. With purines, we start with ribose. With pyrimidines, we only add it when it's all done already, okay? Big difference. All right, so we join the ribose to it, and we get a substance looking like this, which is already, which is already a nucleotide. Okay, because it has all the ingredients of a nucleotide. It has a sugar, it has a phosphate group, and it has a nitrogenous base. Only the base is not really one of the five that we mentioned, it's a different one. And this nucleotide is called orotidine monophosphate, because it's still orotic acid there. Okay, so it's called orotidine monophosphate. In the final step, and the phosphates leaving. of course, of course, yeah, they just go away as a pyrophosphate, and then they are by pyrophosphatase they are hydrolyzed. This is what drives thermodynamically, what drives drives the reaction. Yeah. So 
sorry? No? This is not uracil. This is orotic acid. So the nucleotide is called orotidine monophosphate. But we'll get there, don't worry. There's just one more step, okay? So in the last step, we decarboxylate, we remove this carboxy group, and we get uridine monophosphate. Well, the name of the enzyme activity would be orotidine monophosphate decarboxylase, that's right. But actually, these two reactions are again done by one enzyme. And it's called uridine, uridine monophosphate synthase. So these two reactions, this adding of activated ribose and the decarboxylation is done by these two enzyme activities are done by one enzyme, which is called UMP synthase, uridine monophosphate synthase. Say again? It does the steps of adding the PRP. Yes. And also the decarboxylation. Correct. Correct. So we have uridine monophosphate, and now what we want to do is to make the rest of the pyrimidines. One of them is relatively simple. And that's cytidine monophosphate. Sorry, do you have a question? Or? No, okay. You were suggesting cytidine or? No. no. We'll get to that, but that's actually a little bit more complicated than it looks, okay? So the easy one is the making of cytidine monophosphate. And since I'm sure that you all know the structures of these uh, compounds, or at least have them in front of you, uh, what do we need to do in order to make uh, cytidine from uridine? Hmm? Removing the O? No, no, we have to. Okay. It's not just removing the O. That wouldn't be quite enough. Yeah. Okay, we need to basically transaminate it in a way. We need to exchange one of the oxygens for nitrogen, right? And we do that, and the donor of nitrogen is glutamine. Okay, so it's actually the am amido nitrogen. So it's not really transaminase, but anyway. But it's adding the, um, uh, the yeah, the amino group. So that's the easy one. That's just in one step. For thymidine, it's a little bit more complicated. Remember we said we agreed that with thymidine there's something different. What is it? Very good. It's a, it's a deoxynucleotide. So before we, we can make thymidine, we have to change uridine monophosphate to deoxyuridine monophosphate, okay? And this is done by an enzyme called the ribonucleotide reductase. Ribonucleotide reductase. And this is actually the enzyme that makes all the deoxynucleotides, okay? So this is not special just for this reaction. But if we want to make any deoxyribonucleotide from any ribonucleotide, ribonucleotide reductase is the enzyme for that. Yep? No, sorry, I did not. Is there an enzyme for the UMP-PCMP? Yes, there is. And it's called, I think it's called UMP amido transferase, but I'm not 100% sure. There is an enzyme, but I'm not. So we don't need to know it. You don't need to know it. Okay, you just need to know the glutamine is needed and then there is an amino group at it, okay? So in the first step, ribonucleotide reductase, which is a very interesting enzyme and it's also one of the target enzymes for the treatment of cancer and we'll talk about it in the next lecture. Well, not 
tomorrow, but in a, in a couple of weeks' time. So ribonucleotide reductase is a very, very interesting enzyme. And that makes deoxy uh, uridine monophosphate from uridine monophosphate. And in the next step, we can finally make it into thymidine. What do we need to do for thymidine? Huh? So we need to add a methyl group. Very good. So we add a methyl group, like so. Well, yes. I mean, it's just deoxyuridine monophosphate. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so we add a methyl group and we make it into thymidine monophosphate. Again, notice that there is no deoxythymidine monophosphate, even though it's a deoxynucleotide, but we just don't say that, okay? It's a bit funny, but that's, that's how it is. Now, what is the source of the methyl group for this methylation? SAM is the answer that everybody gives, and in the morning I had the check group and everybody said SAM. Well, this time it really isn't, okay? It's not even cobalamin, uh, it's tetrahydrofolate. And it's something that's called methylene tetrahydrofolate. Don't worry, in the second half of this lecture, we'll talk a lot more about tetrahydrofolate and, and the various forms of tetrahydrofolate. So we'll, we'll get to that. Just At this point, just know that methylene tetrahydrofolate is the donor of the methyl group here. All right, and we made, uh, we made uh, thymidine. The, the enzyme for this is called thymidylate synthase. Thymidylate synthase. And again, it's one of important enzymes, not so much for the treatment of cancer. Well, sort of, but not, well, it is. For treatment of cancer and also for treatment of the viral diseases, so uh, some of the antivirotic stuff also at attacks thymidylate synthase. It's a very, very important enzyme. All right, and now we have all the pyrimidines that we need. Do you have any questions? All clear? Good, well, that's going better than I thought, yep. Sorry, can you just speak up? It's very. Yeah, we, we discussed that. You don't really need to know that. Okay? It's an amido transferase, but you don't really need to know that. All right. Well, yes? Yes. It's. The, these two steps, so the decarboxylation and the joining of the, of the ribose, so phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, is done by uridine monophosphate synthase. Okay, so both steps are done by the same thing. Yep. At which point does it work? How do you make a deoxynucleotide from a nucleotide? Is this one? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> I thought this is something that you've seen before, what deoxynucleotides look like. And No? Okay. So, yeah, it's that one. Uh, it stands for aspartate transcarbamylase or aspartate carbamyl transferase. It's the same reaction. All right, good. So we can move on to the synthesis of purines. Then we'll cover the degradation and then we'll talk about folic acid metabolism. That's basically the, the rest of the lecture. Just trying to have a look whether I forgot something, but hopefully not.
So as I said, the, one of the biggest differences between pyrimidine and purine synthesis is that for purines, we start with ribose. For pyrimidines, ribose comes in at the end. Here we start with ribose. So this is going to be our starting substance, okay? Phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. How do we make it? We make it from the obvious thing to start with, which is this. What is this called? Ribose phosphate. And where do we get it from? Yeah, from the pentose phosphate cycle, all right? So this comes from the pentose phosphate cycle. And we charge it with two equivalents of ATP. Okay, two ATP, two ADP. And we make the phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. Why am I showing the reaction here? Uh, this reaction, this activation of ribose, is one of the important regulation steps in, in the synthesis of purines, okay? Uh, the enzyme is, is called phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate synthase, and it is inhibited by ATP and GTP. So by the finished purines at the very, very end, so these will inhibit the, uh, the reaction allosterically. Okay, so it's one of the regulation, regulatory steps here. Then we have PRPP, but PRPP, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, can be used, as we saw, both for the synthesis of purines and for the synthesis of pyrimidines. Okay, so here, it's the next step, it's this step, that is really committing this derivative of ribose to the synthesis of purines. And in this step, we take glutamine and we join the amino group, here is the amino group, uh, amido group, but it's, it becomes an amino group, and we join it to the carbon one of the ribose. What we get is phosphoribosyl amine, and this is the first real building block of the, uh, of the whole purine ring. Yep? It's gone as a pyrophosphate, which is then hydrolyzed by pyrophosphatase, and again, that drives the, the reaction. Of what? Phosphoribosyl amine. Phosphoribosyl amine. And the enzyme is called phosphoribosyl uh, pyrophosphate amidotransferase. This enzyme step is another regulatory point. But here, the regulation is a bit, it's a bit more complicated. First of all, there's also a negative feedback inhibition by the finished purine nucleotides. Okay, so they will inhibit it. But, and that's quite interesting, this enzyme is actually positively stimulated by its product, uh, sorry, by its, uh, by its reactant, by, this, by, by uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. So there is a, a positive feedback, not inhibition, but actually stimulation, not feedback, sorry, feed forward, uh, stimulation by the availability of phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate. You can think of it that if you have a lot of uh, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, it means that you have plenty of energy, you have plenty of ATP because you can synthesize this very expensive intermediate. So it's basically telling the cell, you have plenty of stuff, you can make purines. Okay, you can think about it in this way. Okay, it's a very unusual thing. Um, but it does have some profound implications in some diseases, as we'll see in a second, where there is, for example, too much of PRPP and what we end up with is a huge overproduction of purines, even though we don't need that. But there's just some problem with PRPP. We'll see that in a second. All right. So this is the first step that we have in the synthesis of purines. And after that, we have 
a lot of steps that we're not going to go into. But at the end of it, we built the first purine, which looks like this. there. They are pretty much relevant just in biochemistry. There, there could be some partial disorders, but they're not really that important. So we end up with a molecule looking like this. Yes, 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 yes. So we make this. This is the first purine that we make, purine nucleotide that we make. Does anyone know the name of it? It is not. It's IMP, which stands for inosine monophosphate. Inosine monophosphate. Again, this is a nucleotide that you do not normally find in nucleic acids. Okay, it can end up there, but normally it's not there. Okay, but we, we can make all the other ones from it. So this is inosine monophosphate. Do you know what the base is called? Hmm? Nope. Inosine would be this. Okay. It's the nucleoside, would be called inosine. But the base is called, anybody? It's called hypoxanthine. Hypoxanthine. The abbreviation is HYX, hypoxanthine. So this is at the end of the whole thing. Now, I mentioned that we're not going to go into all the individual steps, lots of very strange names, but I think it is very useful to know where do these individual atoms in the purine cycle, where do they come from? Which substrates they're actually built from, okay? So this is something that I want you to know. I'll try to use as many colors as I can to, to show that. Uh, all right, so we already talked about this nitrogen. That's this nitrogen here, okay? So that comes from, from what? From glutamine, correct. That comes from glutamine. As luck would have it, the neighboring nitrogen well, sort of neighboring, is also from glutamine. So this nitrogen is also from glutamine. Uh, let's use this one. The next two carbons to it are also from the same source. And this one is 4-mil tetrahydrofolate. And again, we'll talk about these various forms of tetrahydrofolate in a second. Formal THF. Okay, so these two carbons there. Okay. The next nitrogen here, this one, comes from aspartate. Party. And this carbon here comes from carbon dioxide. This one. The final bit 
that I don't think I have any color to denote. But, okay, let's use white then. The final bit is this whole thing. Yeah, the rest of the carbons are accounted for, or the rest of the atoms. And this is the only one that's missing. And this whole thing comes from glycine. It's actually glycine. Glycine. And this is how we built the, the whole purine. You can see that all these steps with all the different names, very, very strange names of intermediates, there's a lot of stuff. If you're really interested, you can have a look in any biochemistry textbook, you'll see them bit by bit, but I don't think it's really important to know it. But knowing which carbons come from what is, is actually useful. All right? All right. So we have inosine monophosphate, and then we, now we want to make um, the other pure nucleotides. One of them is relatively simply made from inosine monophosphate when you look at it. Hmm? Adenosine monophosphate, right? Because what, we do, what do we need to do to, to make adenosine monophosphate from this one, from inosine monophosphate? Right, we just basically exchange this, we transaminate or whatever this, uh, this oxygen to get a, an amino group there, right? So that's easily done. And the donor of this amino group is aspartate. So aspartic acid actually binds to it, and then succinate is, is released. It's a similar reaction to uh, one other reaction where this happens. Uh, huh? When aspartate comes and binds to something, and then succinate, well, fumarate, is released. Correct, in the urea cycle, it's a similar reaction, okay? So this is, this is quite a similar reaction happening here, okay? Uh, and we get AMP, right? So aspartate, fumarate, goes away. It's in two steps, but that's not really. Do you, do you all understand what happened here? Aspartate comes in, fumarate comes out, and the only thing that's remaining is the amino group, and we get adenosine monophosphate. For guanosine monophosphate, it's a little bit more involved. We actually need two steps to it. Do you all, or if you have a structure in front of you, or do, do you know what we need to do to inosine monophosphate in order to make it into guanosine monophosphate? So there will be an NH group here, right? Okay, so first we need to prepare the place for the nitrogen by adding an oxygen there, by dehydrogenation, okay? So what we make is, I'm just gonna draw the base, not the whole thing. Like so, okay, some double bonds there. That's not really that important. And this base is called xanthine. So we had hypoxanthine, and this one's called xanthine. It's still connected to the ribose, okay? I'm just not drawing it there. So actually it's not xanthine, but it's actually xanthosine monophosphate that we get from it. So it's a dehydrogenation, okay? Dehydrogenation, and we get xanthosine monophosphate. Then we add an amino group from glutamine. And we have one osine monophosphate. Does it make sense? Sort of, maybe. Okay, let's take a five minute break, okay? And then we, if you need to, we can go back and maybe to repeat some of the things. Do you have any further questions about the, the synthesis? Again, 
those pathways, as most paths, as most most pathways, are very easily found anywhere on the internet, textbooks. They're just everywhere. Okay, so even if you missed missed some detail, it's really very very easy to find them. All right, good. No questions. No. All right. So we'll now move on to the degradation of these nucleotides, how they are degraded and excreted. This is actually relatively, well, it's definitely a lot simpler than the synthesis. The pyrimidine nucleotides are degraded essentially to carbon dioxide and water. Okay, so pyrimidines uh, and nitrogen, of course. Uh, pyrimidines are basically degraded all the way. Okay, Th there are some complications in it, but in the end, they are completely degraded. Okay, for purines, this is not possible. We, as humans, as mammals, are unable to uh, to completely degrade nucleotides. Some other animals are, but we uh, sorry purines, but we aren't. The final product of purine degradation is something that you've already heard about, and that's final product, purine. It's not urea, no. It's uric acid. It's uric acid. And uh, when you see the structure of uric acid, you'll see how easy it is to make it from purines. Because basically, we were pretty much there already. Um, this is uric acid. This is the final product of purine degradation. And you can already kind of see how, hopefully, uh, how we can make it from all the purines. Okay. From adenine, for example, if we start with adenine, We first deaminate adenine, and we get what? Sorry. Okay. So okay. Well, that would be from adenosine. But if we use adenine, we get we get hypoxanthine. Okay. Here we're just talking about the base. Okay. So we get hypoxanthine. Then in the next step, we take hypoxanthine and we oxidize it to xanthine. And then we do another oxidation and we get uric acid. Similar steps could be found for guanosine. But there, the deamination already gives us xanthine. Yeah? So we're already kind of, we join here from guanosine. Sorry, from guanidine. All right. The two oxidations here are done by the same enzyme, and the enzyme is called xanthine oxidase. Xanthine oxidase, so it, it catalyzes both of these reactions. Uh, xanthine oxidase, apart from being a pharmacological target, uh, we may get to it in a second, what, what it's actually used for, is quite interesting from the point of view of uh, trace metals, because it contains a very interesting trace metal. Does anyone know which one? Lead? No, it's not a trace metal. <laughs> Lead has no biological function. Okay, okay. Lots of different ones. It actually contains molybdenum. A molybdenum, molybdenum containing enzyme. So this is just an interesting thing. If somebody asks you what, which enzyme contains molybdenum, you can say, well, obviously, it's anti oxidase. <laughs> All 
Right. So uric acid is the final end product of purine metabolism. But that is actually a potential problem connected to uric acid. What is it? We kind of discussed it a little bit when we had the practical about urine. Correct. Uric acid is actually relatively poorly soluble in water. So as the concentration gets higher, it has a propensity to crystallize, to drop out of solution as, as crystals. And these crystals can form in the kidneys and can cause damage to the kidneys, or, and that's typical, they drop out in the small joints of the hands and of the feet. And as they drop out, they cause this very, very extremely, extremely painful inflammation of the joint. And this disease is called called anemia? No. <laughs> it's painful inflamed joints. It's called, it's called gout, correct. It's called gout. Okay, you read about it in old books, how the wealthy and the nobles suffered from gout because uh, gout is actually, even today, it still exists and people have it. It's connected generally to, to metabolic disorders caused by diet and obesity, etc. So something that we call metabolic syndrome. Obese people, people who eat a lot of meat, a lot of products that contain a lot of purines, okay? Because these are all degraded to, um, to uric acid and they can cause this, uh, this hyperuricemia, too much uric acid in the blood, and then gout, okay? The, the joint pain is extremely painful uh, but there are treatments for it. One of the chronic treatments, so not for the acute attack, but one of the chronic treatments are actually inhibitors of xanthine oxidase. So there's a drug called allopurinol, which you don't really need to know at this point, um, which inhibits xanthine oxidase and therefore it slows down the production of uric acid. Okay? And that alleviates some of the problems in, in, in people with hyperuricemia. Of course, the most important thing is to, to change their diet and to make them lose weight, etc. Yeah. But then how, so if it decreases its activity, how are we going to degrade it? Yeah, I mean, they might not be degraded because the degradation pathway is not the only possible fate for them. They can be reused, and they are actually reused, especially for purines. The majority of purines in our body are continuously reused. In fact, we can also reuse the purines that we get from the diet. Okay, so if you eat something that contains nucleic acids, which is pretty much everything that we eat, um, then these nucleic acids are broken down in the digestive tract and the, both the nucleotides, nucleosides, or the bases generally are recycled. And they can be reused, they can be taken up and, and reused. In fact, we have special enzymes that are that the, whose role it is to take a base and turn it into a nucleotide, okay? So wherever during degradation of cells or, or digestion or whatever, you end up with individual bases, there are enzymes that can turn them back into nucleotides so that they can be used for whatever is needed. Uh, what, do you need to do? what do you need to do if you have an individual base and you need to turn it into a nucleotide? We already see that. We already saw that in, in, well. And how do we do that? We use something that, of course, we use PRPP, right? It's the same reaction that we used for, for example, for orotate to make orotidine monophosphate. So it's basically the same reaction, okay? And the enzymes, there are two main enzymes that do this, and one is called adenine, Phosphoribosyl, tri uh, phosphoribosyl transferase. So that will take adenine to make it into AMP. So it's called adenine phosphoribosyl transferase. Okay. And the other one is a bit more uh, promiscuous. It will take pretty much any base. And that's called hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase. Yeah. So something into NTP. And this is catalyzed. It's, it, 
it isn't. You just have to kind of separate it into individual bits and then it makes sense what, what the name is. The name as a whole sounds really strange, but it's hypoxanthine guanine. We saw hypoxanthine, okay? We know guanine, so those are two, two purine bases, and then it just says phosphoribosyl transferase because that's what it does. It transfers a phosphoribose. Do you want me to write it down? No, can you just please read Okay, so hypoxanthine, one base, one sub substrate. Guanine, another possible substrate, okay? And then it's phosphoribosyl transferase because it takes PRPP and transfers the phosphoribose to it, basically. So it's a phosphoribosyl transferase. Okay, so the name is, yeah, not easy, but when you understand what it means, it's actually relatively easy to put it together. And then So it takes pretty much any base and makes it into, sorry, not NTP, but NMP. A monophosphate, sorry. Yeah, it's, it has much broader specificity, so it, it can take other ones. It's called adenine phosphoribosyl transferase. Now, I don't want to say. N stands for any nucleotide. Any N. X is something. Okay. Into any kind of monophosphate. Sorry? No, X stands for anything. Okay. So I can put Q there or something. I don't know. Yeah. Now, so these two enzymes are responsible for recycling these, these bases so that we don't have to spend a lot of energy and a lot of material to, to make them continuously. So they're recycled, they're taken from the, uh, from the diet. This recycling is much more important for purines. There is recycling of pyrimidines, but not as much. Okay? So the majority of, of nucleotides that are recycled are purines. Okay? So it's much, much, much more important. Yes? And this happens all over in the body as well? Yes, pretty much. Uh, yes, it does. Sorry? Yes, yes, it occurs in the cytosol. Okay. The main site, from the point of view of the body, the main site for purine synthesis is in the liver. Okay. So the majority of purines are synthesized in the liver, but potentially any cell is capable of synthesizing them when it's, when it's needed. Now, the reason, one of the reasons why I'm mentioning these enzymes is not just to show you that they are recycled, but also there is some interesting, if bizarre and sad, you could say, genetic disorder of this enzyme, of this hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase. Uh, it's called Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. Lesch-Nyhan syndrome. Um, and it's a, it's a deficiency, it's a defect of hypoxanthine guanine phosphoribosyl transferase. Um, what does it do? Well, uh, so it's an inborn error of metabolism, and the, the main presentation, it's, I, it's, if I'm correct, I think it's X-linked. Um, so, so the majority of, of children who suffer from it are male children. Um, and the presentation is very strange. There is very profound, well, to varying degrees, but quite profound neuropsychiatric retardation, so slow, of slow development. But the most bizarre symptom is a tendency, a very strong tendency to self-mutilation, to self-harm. So these children actually, if they are not restrained, they have a tendency to bite their fingers off. So not their fingernails, but their fingers off. Sometimes they bind their lips off. Uh, so there is a very, very bizarre presentation which can actually lead to very, very significant damage to their bodies. And these children suffering from this very sad and incurable disease um, have to be physically restrained from harming themselves. Um, so, so this is just uh, uh, an illustration that something that appears to be somewhere hidden in purine synthesis or whatever or recycling uh, can have its its defect. Its defect can have this very profound effect. Yes. 
Um, not really. It's all just symptomatic treatment and palliative care, basically. Um, as far as I know, you, you really can't. I mean, there's, there's basically a nece necessity for physical restraint. Um, but there are varying degrees of uh, the neuropsychiatric defect. So I've never actually seen a person with that. It's a relatively rare disorder, okay? But from what I read, some of them are actually can at some level communicate, okay? So, so there is a possibility. But you can't, like, uh, when they do communicate, apparently, that's what it says in the literature, um, they ask you to restrain them physically because they cannot stop themselves from harming themselves, basically. They still feel the pain. Oh, absolutely, yes. Yes, they absolutely do. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty horrible disease, but as I say, it's fairly rare. Yeah? Um, it's X-linked recessive, but I mean, for X-linked, it's a bit, yeah, but it's, it's recessive, you could say, yes. Um, the other symptom, the other symptom in Lesch-Nyhan syndrome is actually an overproduction of purines. Why is that? Well, HGPRT uses as its substrate, normally when it's functioning, it uses as its substrate PRPP. When the enzyme is deficient, there's a lot of PRPP which is available. And since we said that there's this weird uh, feed-forward activation of purine synthesis, when you have a lot of PRPP, you will start synthesizing more and more purines even though you don't really need them. Okay, so there's an overproduction of purine, overproduction of uric acid, and there can be gout associated with that as well. Um, it's relatively short, but it's not like just a few months or something. It, it's, it's definitely years, yeah. Multiple years, I think there might be some that grow to, uh, to adulthood. And it's horrible, uh, but fortunately it's very rare. All right, um, so this is about the degradation, recycling, um, et cetera, of purines and pyrimidines. The final bits that I want to talk about uh, actually, I'll mention one more thing. You've heard, or you will hear, but you've probably heard already, uh, about severe combined immune deficiency. Yeah? Yeah, in children, children that are born basically without any immune system, sort of, okay? Do you know what it's caused by? Yes, it's good, that's it, yes? Do you know what? It could be. But actually a lot of them, and I think even the majority of cases, are actually caused by a defect in adenine deaminase. So it's, it's a relatively simple enzyme defect, which causes basically disappearance of white blood cells, of lymphocytes. Uh, the reason behind it is a little bit complicated. There's just too much adenine, too much adenosine, which then blocks ribonucleotide reductase, and therefore none of the other nucleotides are synthesized. But this is just an information when you call about skid. Yes, there are different types, okay? But, but a lot of cases are caused by this one simple enzyme defect. And there have been attempts at treating these children both with uh, infusions of the enzyme, uh, but also gene therapy. And I, it was actually, if I'm not mistaken, it may have been the first disease to be treated by gene therapy. But actually it was a disaster, it didn't work at all. Uh, and I think some of the children died or something. So it actually stopped the trials for a very long time. Uh, but anyway, this is just another interesting connection of purine metabolism to something else. The final bit, it's not very interesting, no? <laughs> The final bit that I want to talk about is the metabolism of folic acid, because we saw that we need a lot of various bits of folic acid for synthesizing one pyrimidine. Which one? Okay, that we need folic acid or its derivatives for synthesizing one pyrimidine. One pyrimidine. Thymidine, okay, thymidine or thymine, okay, for the base. And we need it for two carbons in the purine ring, okay? So tetrahydrofolate is essential for synthesizing both, pure, well, both purines, all of them, and thymidine. So how does it work with, um, uh, with folate? I'll just very quickly draw the structure of folic acid, but of course, this is not something that we require you to, to know. I will just draw it in order to uh, 
be able then to illustrate some of the uh, deriv deriv derivatives that there are. Now, some of you have had or will have a presentation of folic acid, so hopefully this will help you, or maybe not if it's too late, in your, in your seminars. Who will present on folic acid or has already? Have you done that already? Or? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Okay, well, they have a little bit of a help. So this is the structure of this is the structure of folic acid. Okay, uh, sorry, some double bonds here. Again, this is not something you need to know, but we'll use it for something else. Um, didn't I just say like five times that you do not need to know the structure? Yeah. Okay, you don't need to know the structure, but you need to know the rest of it, just not the structure. All right. So folic acid is a very important carrier of one carbon fragments, okay? We already talked about s adenosyl methionine, which is a carrier of methyl group. This is another very, very important carrier of, of single carbon fragments, of one carbon fragments. Now, folic acid on its own is not active. We first need to reduce it, and we actually need to reduce it twice in order to get to its active form, which is called tetrahydrofolate, tetrahydrofolic acid, which is basically, if you look at me, just get rid of these two double bonds, and we have tetrahydrofolic acid. Both of these reductions, so the one from folic acid to dihydrofolic acid, from dihydrofolic acid to tetrahydrofolic acid, are done by the same enzyme, which is called dihydrofolate reductase. So. Okay, it's called dihydrofolate reductase. The two sequential reductions from folic acid to tetrahydrofolate. Why am I emphasizing this enzyme? This enzyme, again, is a very important target enzyme for the treatment of cancer, for the treatment of some autoimmune diseases, and also for treating some bacterial disorders, some, some bacterial infections. Okay, we'll talk about that in the, the next lecture when we talk about the treatment of cancer, but this is just uh, sort of a hook that you prepare for, for next time. So dihydrofolate reductase is a very important enzyme. Right, so now we have tetrahydrofolate, and since it's a carrier of one carbon fragments, before we can use it for transferring an one carbon frag a one carbon fragment anywhere, we need to charge it when, with a one carbon fragment, right? Uh, there are sev several ways of doing that. Yeah? I'm sorry, I got a bit lost. The charging will happen in the tetrahydrofolate. Yes, this is the only one that's useful for us. Okay. Sort of, yes. Okay. This is the real, the, the real and, coenzyme. And why does this small change happen? Because that's how nature <laughs> made it. <laughs> it looks like a small change. But actually, if you looked at the 3D structure of the molecule, it makes a big change to the shape of it, okay? So it looks like I just kind of yeah. removed two small you know, bits of it, but it actually makes quite a big difference to the shape of it. So anyway, how do we charge it? There are several different ways, but the main way to charge it is by turning serine to glycine. You've probably already given up, haven't you? <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, if you remember the structures of serine and glycine, well, the hydroxyl group doesn't really play a major role there, but we're removing just one carbon. Okay, one carbon and one hydroxyl. Okay? What do we get from it? 
we get the first derivative of tetrahydrofolate, which is called methylene tetrahydrofolate. I'll draw it in a second what it actually looks like. Methylene tetrahydrofolate. I'll show you what it looks like in the structure. This is nitrogen 5, this is nitrogen 10. You don't need to know that. And methylene tetrahydrofolate looks like this. Okay, so there's a CH2 group connecting these two nitrogens. Okay. In literature, you can find this N5, N10 methylene tetrahydrofolate, but you don't need to know that. So this is the first derivative that we get from, tetrahydrofolate, uh, from charging tetrahydrofolate. And we already mentioned methylene tetrahydrofolate today. What is it needed for? Into? No. Deoxyuridine monophosphate to thymidine monophosphate, correct, okay? So methylene tetrahydrofolate is absolutely essential for making thymine or thymidine, okay? Without it, we can't make nucleic acids because thymidine is, well, we can't make DNA, rather, because we need thymine for that, all right? However, methylene tetrahydrofolate can be also changed to other forms of tetrahydrofolate. It can be oxidized, for example, to formyl tetrahydrofolate. Formyl tetrahydrofolate. Which basically means this. This is formyl tetrahydrofolate. Well, N10 formyl. It can be also N5 formyl, but uh, whatever. And this we already saw today as well, because this is the form of tetrahydrofolate needed for the two purine carbons there. Okay, if you remember the colored picture. Well, yeah, for the, for, yes, for the purine synthesis, all right? So formal tetrahydrofolate is needed for the purine synthesis. Now, and this is crucial, well, sort of, but anyway. This reaction, this oxidation, is reversible. So we can also reduce it back to, to, to methylene. This is, we can exchange them whatever is needed. However, there is another possibility that we can make from methylene tetrahydrofolate. We can reduce it and make it into methyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay, what does it look like? It looks like this. Just one second. Okay, so the possibility is we can use methylene tetrahydrofolate to make thymidine. We can oxidize it to formal tetrahydrofolate reversibly uh, to make purine, purines and some other things. Or we can reduce it to make methyl tetrahydrofolate. However, and this is very important, this reduction is not reversible. So we can't go back to methylene tetrahydrofolate once we've made methyl tetrahydrofolate. Why is that crucial? Well, just bear with me. This is going to be the last piece of important information now, okay? But it's really important. There's one reaction where we need methyl tetrahydrofolate, where we use it. Does anyone remember what reaction that is? Very good. So it is the recharging of homocysteine to methionine. Okay, and this is where the methyl group com comes, for the, uh, uh, comes from. All right, and then we can make s adenosyl methionine or whatever and, and add and put this methyl group elsewhere, but let's not complicate it now. Okay, this is the only reaction that uses methyl tetrahydrofolate. And we also need something else for this reaction. 
I can see that people are, is there something unclear? No? Okay, so homocysteine is methionine missing a methyl group. And there's a reaction, a well-used reaction, you know, uh, to recharge it back to make methionine. And this methyl group for it comes from methyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay, so all these reactions where we use s adenosyl methionine as a donor of methyl, essentially it's all coming from here, only it goes through methionine and then to s adenosyl methionine. Yeah? Or hopefully I didn't confuse you even more than you were. No, good. We need something else for this reaction. Very good. We need vitamin B12 for this. We need cobalamin as a cofactor, as a, as a, as a, yeah, in the enzyme. It's actually one of the two, one of the only two reactions where we need cobalamin. Okay. Now, let's join it all together and this is going to be in the last minute. What happens when we don't have enough B12? We can't make methionine, so there's going to be too much homocysteine, whatever. But the other problem is that we're going to be accumulating more and more methyl tetrahydrofolate because this reaction is still, con the reduction still goes on, but there is no way to get rid of the methyl group without B12. Because once we get rid of the methyl group, tetrahydrofolate comes back and can be recycled for whatever. But if we don't have B12, we can't do this reaction and we accumulate more and more tetrahydrofolate as methyl tetrahydrofolate. But for the synthesis of both purines and pyrimidines, we can't use methyl tetrahydrofolate. We need methylene or formal, but we can't turn it back to these forms. So essentially, when we're lacking B12, many of the symptoms, well, the main symptom, which is anemia, which is megaloblastic anemia, anemia with big cells, is actually caused by a deficiency of folic acid. Because B12 has no direct involvement in, in any of these reactions. It's only indirectly because we are sequestering, we are kind of getting more and more tetrahydrofolate in the form of methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is not usable for these reactions. You have too much methyl tetrahydrofolate, not too much, and not enough of the other forms that you need, correct. Too little of the rest. So not from too much. No, that's not really a problem. Okay. However, and you'll have that in your presentations that you have already when, we t when you talk about B12, there's another reaction which also needs B12, and that has nothing to do with these. Okay. Why am I stressing this? This is one of the fundamental clinical problems that you can harm people. A person comes to you and says, well, I have anemia. Well, they probably don't say that, but you find out that they have anemia and that their blood cells are too big. And then there are two possibilities. First possibility is that they have too little folic acid. The other possibility is that they have too little B12. If you don't find out and you just give them folic acid, the anemia will go away in both cases because they are both essentially caused by a lack of folic acid, right? So the anemia goes away and it feels like you've cured the patient. However, if the real problem is B12 deficiency, this other reaction, hopefully you'll hear about it in your seminar, will still be deficient. And this, cause then, this causes then neurodegeneration and basically irreversible damage to the uh, nervous system. So this is a very dangerous thing to do. And if you have megaloblastic anemia or if, if you have a, anemia with big red blood cells, you always need to find out whether it's because of folic acid deficiency or B12 deficiency. All right. Any questions? No? All right, so that's all. <laughs>